This is a Peabody. Not a Martini Henry, but a Peabody in theoretically like 11.15 Romanian Beaumont. I don't know what it's in, but the complaint was is that we couldn't shut the breach. Well, I'm wondering if this might have something to do with it. Um, so then they felt compelled to disassemble the entire gun to try to find out why this was loose, I guess. Down the rabbit hole, let's see if somewhere inside this bag of parts, we can come up with an operational uh, Peabody and uh, maybe dump a few rounds through it. Let's go. This Peabody was in a, it was chambered in a cartridge that was just rare, and we didn't want to make a hobby out of reloading ammo for yet another gun. So we decided to sleeve this particular gun in 4570, and the sleeve of choice is going to be an old Swiss Vetterli barrel. So we know the steel was at least the best quality available at the time. So watch here. We're going to go ahead and bore a hole in the back end of the Peabody barrel. blew it all up and then cut an extractor slot. Then we have to modify the uh, the ramp on the bolt, on the, uh, the part that actually closes the gun up. So just take a watch and watch this happen and we'll roll back out of this.
Again, I'm going to say a Dremel tool has a place in the shop. It's just not your go-to. All right, after all that messing around, we dug a lot out of this. And I mean, we dug as much out of it as you can physically get. This breech block is getting a little bit thin here. All of its strength radiates from the outside. We'll talk about that in a minute. When we did the original, this is an 11.4 by 49 rimmed Romanian Peabody round. You can see here where the, where the uh, rifling starts. The 4570 that we're chambering it in, this gun had been chambered in 4570 at one time, um, is significantly longer. And this is fatter down here near the back end. So the aperture to fit this in, it's just a little bit tight right there. So what we'll probably wind up doing, I'll pop this barrel off one more time and we'll take just a small cut like you would on a 45 ACP out of the inside in order to make this go by a little bit easier so that when you go to open it this will come the rest of the way out and there's not much holding it in there so we've successfully probably put the longest flipping round in this thing we can get in it and still get away with it um, as we just saw we did all the chambering work and it looks pretty good from back here i'll clean up all these sideward um, uh, marks and we know the headspace is on the money because the headspace was right when it was flush and we just mimicked the old barrel. Some other things to note is this is an epic dovetail. And my sleeve ends right about where this um, right about where this screwdriver is. And I wanted the sleeve to end before the end of the cartridge so that when this thing belches fire, it's not cutting the glue joint. You can get away with Acroglass on black powder single shot applications. There's a lot of square inches in here and I don't care if you try, you can't run this gun hard enough to get this warm enough and not only that, but the sleeve is trapped. So it's just like the Kammerlader, it's not going anywhere. If this was a center fire smokeless round, that would have been silver soldered in. And the depth of this cut would have meant that the chamber where it stopped there would have been a hell of a stress riser here. I would not convert this barrel set up to a smokeless round. Um, you guys have got a lot of stuff. You got to you gotta learn before you get here and start messing with this. I'll tell you that firing pin tunnel is right there. This is really, really, really stupid thin right here. Stupid thin, like stupid thin. So um, again, unless you really get it, don't do this. Right here, with the three-corner scraper, I'm pulling just a slight amount of this out. And this will assist the cartridge in going around the corner. Now, remember, we're upside down. So it's going to come around the corner. That little bit of a 4570 case head that's unsupported is not even remotely going to get us. But that's part of how we're dealing with that length. You would do this to, like, a 45 ACP barrel you, when you're ramping it you can get away with a surprising amount of lack of support because the cartridge is extremely hard right there. This case is very thick to like right about here. So we're just going to leave just, you know, an eighth of an inch of it unsupported here. And that will allow it to get around the corner smoothly, you see. It does not require a tremendous amount of that to be missing for it to be able to just slide right around the corner and draw up tight right here. That's where we're going to go. These Acme threads, they were rusted. Um, I've come in and gotten rid of most of the spooge here. So what we'll do then is, now that we've gone ahead and, and cut that, I'll put a little bit of blue Loctite on these threads, walk the receiver up on. Actually, I'm not going to Loctite them because I intend to take this gun back apart again and blue it once we know that it works. So I'm not gonna Loctite them now, but only blue Loctite. So a little bit of heat and it'll pop right back off. 
And what concerns me is, is there is not a tremendous amount of torque that it takes to get this thing to draw up. And the, where the camera is right now, you can't see it. But there's a line here. And there's a line right there. And to make the two lines line up, I just have to really fast. And I want something more than that. And that's why it was loose in the first place. And we're right back to why we're here. All this other stuff was just, well, because I can. So you remember the guy that shot the wall gun? Well, that crazy, that crazy buck is back in the shop, and he asked a great question that I don't know the answer to, and maybe you guys can help me. How did they machine a, a segment of a circle into the back of this receiver with square corners here and here without having to come in this way? Because it's definitely cut this way. So all you guys out there that want to kibitz my machining, Maybe one of you bright as a bulb guys will tell me how in the heck they made that cut. The importance of that cut is, let me get this in here. The importance of that cut is the cut takes the recoil load in this design, as in the subsequent Martini um, uh, Henry's and the Martini Peabody's. All of the bolt thrust coming backward is coming into that cut, not into this pin. If it came into this pin, that pin would be wobbly very quickly. And that's why falling block uh, weapons like a rolling block Remington have got half inch diameter pins on them. Anyway, really like to know how the hell they did that. And um, if you got an idea, now's the time to buck up. The Peabody predates the Martini Peabody, which predates the Martini Henry. This is an old girl right here. I think it was originally supposed to go to the Romanians and it didn't. It stuck around for a long time. It's been hot dip blued, hence its casual appearance to a table lamp in a French whorehouse. Um, we were not the ones that made the decision to mess this particular gun up. Um, but what we've done is rechamber it in 4570. I'm gonna tell you I'm the first guy to shoot this, so I am gonna put on some glasses. So as you can plainly see, we've got a little bit more material to remove here, just to give the cartridge an even exit. We've taken an awful lot off the top of this block, but you got to admit, it's a pretty powerful little sucker. So that's all I got to say about that. Let's get back inside, shall we? Peabody rifle. I did make the statement earlier in here that, that, that this gun had been chambered in 4570, not this particular gun, but examples of the Peabody had been done in it. It was a safe conversion to make and it runs great. And as always, it's been a pleasure to share with you guys a little sliver of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis.